Thank you, Yeronda, and, and welcome um, to this series of talks run by Christiane Kienossi. Um, as I was saying before, the, the seminar series has the theme, O Theos Antiliptor Mui, Tu Eleos Uproftasime. In English, God, you are my protector, your mercy shall go before me, him, before me, I'm sorry. Um, and as I was saying before, this Christian energy, I think, has to has to be commended for its efforts in lining up such a, um, uh, a an amazing um, group of speakers, hierarchs of our church, and and distinguished members of the clergy. Um, as we know, Yerunda is is the abbot of the Holy Monastery of Panagia Pandanasa at Mangrove Mountain. Um, he he hardly needs an introduction, um, but I will um, I will give him a bit of an introduction after we hear some songs, which um, Kirio Yanga will kindly arrange for us.
Thank you very much to the, the youth groups of, um, of Trito Kiklo, um, of, of both the, the men and women for arranging those songs. They were beautiful. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, Yerunda Efsevio is the abbot of the holy monastery of Pandanasa at Mangrove Mountain. And um, he's familiar to many of us as a spiritual father and a, a strong guiding voice of orthodoxy in Australia. Uh, we have the incredible privilege of having our elder join us today from Mangrove Mountain. Um, and it's an incredible blessing. And we thank you very much for his efforts. Um, the topic of today's seminar is the cross-bearing Christian. With Yerunda's blessing, there will be an opportunity at the end for, for some questions for him. Uh, in the meantime, we ask that everyone keeps their, their microphones on the mute setting. And um, Yerunda will we'll ask you to um, take the microphone now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Dobropoulos. Uh, I have to say that um, at the moment, I'm quite uh, moved. It's a blessing to, <clears throat> to see you all again. Um, as you know, because of the lockdown, we haven't been able to meet. And it was a very moving <clears throat> blessing to see the young people chant the, so beautifully the songs and the, the hymn of our cross. Uh, may God um, bless them and uh, all of you for your efforts. So let's begin. Um, your Grace Bishop Siloam, Reverend Fathers, D. Dr. John Saramatis, President of the Orthodox Christian Society, Emesis, much esteemed Professor Dr. Michael Anthony, Mrs. Katerina Stavropoulos, representative of the Ladies Kitlu, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Good afternoon. Thank you for your invitation to share a few thoughts with you this afternoon via Zoom. And as we were just saying, with the pandemic lockdown, we are all uh, physically isolated from one another and we need to find ways uh, to remain connected or better still in communion. And uh, I congratulate Enesis and the Kiklo Ladies Group on this initiative and on all the good work that they do in our Archdiocese with the blessings of His Eminence, our Archbishop Macarius, 
they coordinate the Sunday schools, your, your mother groups for teenagers and Bible groups for adults and much more. And uh, I especially thank you for your Greek Orthodox ethos, which was evident especially this year in the excellent celebrations for the 200th anniversary for the independence of Greece. Congratulations. This afternoon, I must confess that we will be touching on a challenging and, and very broad topic. It will not be possible to cover it comprehensively in such a short time frame. I pray, however, that I respond to your expectations and um, ask for your prayers and leniency. Our topic is the most venerable, precious and life-giving cross, or as indicated on the flyer, the cross-bearing Christian. The Holy Cross has a very special place in the Orthodox Church. In fact, we know in the monastery, because we have the privilege to celebrate each day the services, that every Wednesday and Friday we commemorate the cross, not only just with fasting, but with dedicated canons and hymns in the Vespers and Matin service. But on 14 September, just two weeks ago, and on the third Sunday of Great Lent, our church triumphantly presents and invites all the faithful to venerate the Holy Cross with awe and faith, singing the dismissal hymn, which we just sang in Greek, Save, O Lord, your people, and bless your inheritance, grant victory to the faithful over their adversaries, and protect your commonwealth by the power of your cross. As Orthodox Christians, we embrace the cross as a holy symbol. It is the official emblem of our church. Originally, however, 20 centuries ago, the cross was an instrument of punishment and horrible death. The Romans sentenced the worst criminals to death by crucifixion. This instrument of punishment, humiliation and shame from the moment God's expression of love, which is our Lord Jesus Christ himself, died on the cross for the salvation of the entire humanity, the cross was transformed into a symbol of God's infinite love for fallen mankind. As we sing in one hymn, it is no longer the punishment of the condemned, but it has become the trophy of our salvation. Since then, the cross has become the symbol of hope and life for Orthodox Christians because the, the grace and power of the Holy Cross comes not from its form, that is, its shape, but from the fact that it is the instrument upon which Christ was crucified and through which Christ delivered salvation to mankind. If you like, the cross is the altar upon which Christ was sacrificed for the entire world and death was conquered. It is the, the sign of the power of Christ now, a sign which marks all believers and by which we mark all things. The cross is evoked every day as the power of the resurrection. It is placed on the domes of our churches. It is in our homes, in our cars. We hang it around our necks. In all church services, the priest blesses and sanctifies all mysteries with the sign of the cross. In fact, in one hymn, the church sings beautifully, the cross is the guardian of the entire universe. The cross is the beauty of the church. The cross is the might of kings. The cross is support for the faithful. The cross is the glory of angels and wound to the demons. We all agree, as we said, that it is a holy symbol and the emblem of our church, the symbol of victory and freedom. But what did Christ accomplish 
on the cross. Firstly, the crucifixions, the sufferings and death of Christ in obedience to the Father, reveals the magnitude of God's love for us. For as we read in Philippians, it clearly says there nicely, beautifully, he emptied himself, taking the form of a human servant, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross for us men and for our salvation. Adam and Eve's disobedience and exile from paradise resulted in a tragic division between God and man. And only Jesus Christ as perfect God and man through the taking on of human nature was able to unite us again to God. But first, he had to do away with death and corruption. So he assumed a human body in order that in it, death might once and for all be destroyed. He made death to die and to become itself the source and the way of life eternal. As we sing at Easter, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. In this way, Jesus freed us from the tyranny of the devil and the chains of sin were broken and he now reinstates us to freedom in Jesus Christ. Because of all this, the cross now possesses the power and the grace of Christ, which when he was crucified, he transferred in a mystical and incomprehensible way to his cross. As wisely, the hymnology tells us, your cross, O Christ, although materially is seen as wood, it is covered with divine rain. And the world perceives it with the senses, but spiritually, it miraculously worked out our salvation. So the cross, we confirm again, has become the symbol of Christ himself. St. Macarius, referring to the power of the cross, says, crossing oneself once with faith may be more powerful than offering many words of prayer. He says, do inappropriate thoughts and desires disturb your soul? Fortify yourself with the sign of the cross and your thoughts will be subdued. Is your heart tortured by melancholy and sorrow? Are you surrounded by temptations? It resorts yourself to the power of the cross and the serenity of your soul will come back. Our Lord, however, my dear brothers and sisters, does not want us to merely venerate the cross as a holy symbol. He wants us to follow him on the path of the cross. The cross in the Orthodox Church signifies a way of life, a way of life that frees me, liberates me, and renews me spiritually. Living according to the way of the cross transforms my mind, purifies my thinking, opens the eyes of my soul, brings about the internal spiritual revolution that we all need and deeply desire. The way of the cross is the only way of life that delivers salvation. And just like we cannot imagine Christ without a cross or his crucifixion and the resurrection, so too we cannot live the Orthodox Christian life without living out our personal cross, crucifixion and resurrection. Now, Apostle Peter, in his first epistle, writes, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. In other words, Apostle Peter says, Christ suffered and died on the cross in order to show us 
how he wants us to endure suffering and to give his meaning to our suffering and death. Because the way of the cross is not just suffering as the world understands suffering. The way of the cross is life. It is dynamism. It is the joy of the resurrection. What do we pray at Easter? Come, all ye faithful, let us venerate Christ's holy resurrection. For behold, through the cross, joy has come into all the world. In fact, Apostle Paul reminds us that we must be co-crucified, co-buried, co-resurrected, and co-glorified all with Jesus Christ. In other words, the cross, the crucifixion, does not stand alone, but is always linked to the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection is the event that reveals the inner meaning of the cross and its fulfillment. Without the resurrection of Christ, the cross would, would remain an instrument of suffering and, and death, having the last word in a fallen and irredeemable world. We express this liturgically through the powerful hymn that accompanies our veneration of the cross sung during the great feast of the exaltation of the cross. Before thy cross, we bow down in worship, O Master, and thy holy resurrection we glorify. When Christ started telling his disciples that he must suffer the crucifixion, Peter, if you remember from the scriptures, took Jesus aside and said, Far be it from you, Lord. It shall not happen to you. And the Lord responded, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. For you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. At the suggestion that Jesus should not proceed with his crucifixion, he calls Peter Satan. It is as if the Lord said, Peter, life without a cross. You do not have the mindset of God, but of the world. And then the Lord, in order to underline the significance of the crucifixion and his desire that we should all follow his example, he immediately turns to his disciples and puts before them the challenge and invitation that the church puts before each of us. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But these are not my words. These are the words of our Lord. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself himself and take up his cross and follow me with these words the lord clarifies once and for all that if we want to be his disciples we must meet certain criteria and they are that i deny myself carry my cross and follow the lord what does it mean to deny myself how strange. How can we deny ourselves, our existence? It's a paradox. But the self that Jesus asked us to deny is not our true self. Our true self is whom we became at our baptism. At our baptism, we put on Christ. Our true self rests in Christ. Jesus Christ is asking us to deny all the other layers we have put on, to deny my false self, my selfish ego, my passionate desires, all that makes out to be who we are, but which are in fact 
distortions that mask our deeper, truer being. Christ asks us that we deny ourselves so that we can find, find ourselves. It is as if he tells us the pride and ego must go. Your heart needs to be cleansed from evil desires. Bad habits and ties to this world, if you want me to live in your heart, have to go. You cannot serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. Make up your mind. What does it mean to carry my cross? To carry my cross is to undergo the struggle of self-denial willingly, with patience, with insight, out of love for the Lord. St. John Chrysostom says, to carry my cross means to be ready each day for death. It means to appreciate that to strip off my old self with all the passions is not easy and is a continuous suffering. As we try to excavate deep to reveal our true self, our old self constantly struggles against us. I do not want to change its screens. Our passions, our weaknesses, our ego do not want to be humbled. They rebel. If I decide to carry my cross, I have to expect war from my old self. I'm sure we can all relate to this. Listen to how Apostle Paul expresses his anguish. I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells within me. Secondly, to carry my cross also means to accept without complaint the involuntary crosses that are part of this life. To bear poverty, misfortune, illness, without regarding yourself as offended and all for the love of our Lord. The third condition is follow me. Follow me means Christ is not asking us to undertake something new. He's not asking us to walk a path that he has not already walked or to lift anything that he has not already lifted. More importantly, follow me implies that he will walk with me, that he will be with me, not at the end of my cross journey, not at the middle of my journey, throughout the entire journey, from the minute I decide to carry my cross willingly, for Christ's sake, he is with me. This guarantees that in the bitterness and the suffering of any cross that we carry in life is also present the continuous sweetness of his presence. And as the denial of my false self progresses, the more I leave his presence and the more Christ will begin to shine through me. Apostle Paul is an excellent example. In his epistle to the Galatians, he states, I have been crucified with Christ. Christos in Estapo. In other words, I have co-suffered and died with Christ willingly. What does Apostle Paul mean by this? He's referring to the death of his old self, false self. Prior to his physical death, preceded the death of his old life, the death of sin. He exclaims, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
which was possible through the grace of the crucified Lord. In the monastery of St. Paul on Mount Athos, there is a puzzling inscription to be read over the entryway, which I suppose summarizes Apostle Paul. Some of you may know this saying, they say in monasteries regularly, if you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. This is another way of saying the Lord's words, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the way of the cross is the path that leads to spiritual renewal and true life. Yes, it is, as our Lord describes, a narrow path. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Yet there is no other way. And the church prepares us for this journey of the cross from the very beginning of our Christian lives with the sacrament of holy baptism. Baptism is the act of a person's death and resurrection with Jesus Christ. In Romans, Apostle Paul declares, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also might walk in newness of life, new life. At baptism, the sacramental grace accomplishes our dying to the old man and our rebirth as the new man in the image of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. Following this dying and rebirth in Jesus Christ at our baptism, the desire for sin that's in fallen man is no longer unconquerable. Having received simultaneously the Holy Spirit and put on Christ, baptism sets us up on the pathway of the cross that leads towards our perfection in Christ, a deification. However, we're still vulnerable to sin. And the fathers of the church, like St. Peter of Damascus, St. Simeon, the new theologian, and many others, make the point repeatedly that our baptismal renewal must be continuously renewed through the liturgical and sacramental life and through our personal ascetical struggle, which is a continuous gradual self-denial and dying with Christ. St. Gregory of Sinai has a nice passage that I'd like to read to you, which sums it up nicely. Everyone baptized into Christ should pass progressively through all the stages of Christ's own life. For in baptism, he receives the power to progress. And through the commandments, he can discover and learn how to accomplish such progression and living the Lord's crucifixion to die to all things. In baptism and through the liturgical and sacramental life, each of us have received the necessary power to carry our cross as a new and continuous mode of life. We're given all that we need to help us struggle each day to strip off the layers that the world has put on me, to strip away the false self in order to uncover Christ. Now, it depends on me. The ball is in my court. And the question arises in everyone's mind. Are all these easy to accomplish? Is it easy for one to subdue, control, or abandon their selfishness, their pride and ego, 
their established bad habits, the demanding rebellious flesh, it's certain that by ourselves, with our own strength, without the grace of God, it is impossible to cultivate and establish such a holy dislike for ourselves. However, this grace that is available, that can help us, and is offered to us abundantly by God, does not work magically in our lives. We must want to receive God's grace. We must want to struggle in cooperation with him. And I have to demonstrate this. This is why our Lord states it up front clearly. If anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Upon this, whoever wishes rests our entire personal faith and spiritual life. Therefore, if I am concerned because I witness no personal spiritual progress or little spiritual progress in my life, I must question my own personal will. Since God is more than willing to work with us for our salvation, sometimes the issue is that we don't want to lift the crosses that God gives us. Crosses that the Lord prescribes as personal medicine for our spiritual healing. Crosses that up until now I may have ignored or I cannot see them or I'm reluctant to lift them or I look down upon them. When we refer to crosses, we mean everyday life events. You with me, I with you, a husband with a wife and vice versa, the parents with the children and vice versa. We are all crosses to each other. When we sacrifice for each other, when I suffer to bear silently a burden, to suffer a comment from a spouse, an insult, a weakness, a sickness, when I do not express an opinion or a preference and choose silence. We do not need to have big cross events in our lives to have access to crosses. Rather, I'm looking daily, hourly, for opportunities to elevate myself with a cross. To elevate myself spiritually and the law of the day to bring me into the spirit of the resurrection. A cross may externally seem to bring about my loss. It may mean that I'm treated unfairly or that I suffer by bearing another. Yet in this supposed defeat lies the spiritual victory. From the crucifixion came the resurrection. My dear friends, the cross is not doomsday. It is liberation. It comes to save me from my otherwise dangerous old self. Whereas without the cross in our lives, we become secular in everything that we stand for. I continue to be in love with my old self. And I can project the world everywhere from little things to big things. Even from, from the glasses I wear to the hairstyle I have, the ideologies I adopt. So the way we choose our friends and even our spouses, everywhere, the world, nowhere, the cross. And even more, sometimes 
we are across to the person next to us without even realizing the way I speak, the way I react, the way I demand, the way I humiliate others, insist, clash with others, and I'm not even aware of it. This is why we continuously ask for forgiveness for sins, whether known or unknown. We might be very surprised when the Lord presents to us our spiritual balance sheet and discover on the debit side all these entries. And we will say, me, all these things. In other words, we need to be careful just in case we may be insensitive. Spiritually, we may not understand that we might be hurting people awfully without realizing. And the cross comes to humble me, to soften my heart, to heal me, to cleanse my thinking, to purify my mind, to open my eyes, my senses. The cross makes me spiritually functional again. The cross comes to make me Christ-like. As Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. To the world, the cross is madness. Apostle Paul says it, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. A young person who wants to marry and is struggling to find a spouse, they want to live with purity and they respond to everyday challenges and tests. They lift their cross in order to make themselves receptive to the grace of God. And, this, and God brings them into the spirit of the resurrection. And yet, their peers, sometimes, even from within the church, label them as backwards. Crazy. He or she is too conservative, they say. They give them a label, and all of a sudden, they become irrelevant. And this is the problem not in society in general, but could be the problem in the church. Rather than deny the world in us, we project it. And the grace of God remains inactive. It is dormant. It is buried. We have the life-giving message of the cross, and we do not know how to leave it. And we do not know how to deliver it to others. And we remain ineffective as Christians. For this reason, it is very important to learn to lift our cross. I appreciate that sometimes we are scared to lift our cross. The cross naturally includes an element of suffering. I'm dismantling my old self. Our human nature is averse to suffering. Sometimes we see the cross as negative because we do not know. We haven't given ourselves a chance to understand. We haven't appreciated why we are suffering. Yet the more I get myself involved into my cross and help myself to accept my cross, the more then I want it. Because in the cross, I find God. Apostle Paul says, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, our consolation also abounded by Christ. I discover the secret. St. Isaac the Syrian says, 
The cross is the door to mysteries. The knowledge of the cross is concealed in the sufferings of the cross. And the more our participation in its sufferings, the greater the perception we gain through the cross. Let us take the greatest example that exists. The example of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. As a human person, for a time, even Jesus struggled to accept his cross. He prayed to his father three times saying, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. These prayers reveal Jesus' mindset just before the crucifixion. Jesus was in great pain. His sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood. The cup to which Jesus is referring is the suffering he was about to endure. He expresses the natural human desire to avoid pain and suffering. But he finishes the prayer with the words, yet not as I will, but as you will. As soon as he sacrificed his will, he continued with his cross peacefully and had the strength to even comfort others. He said to his mother, from the cross, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And for those who crucified him, he forgave them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And to the thief, he said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in Paris. Why did Jesus say these words only to one thief? Because only one thief accepted his cross. The thief that was saved, remember what he said to the other thief? The one thief was telling Christ what? And the good thief responded, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Upon accepting his cross, the thief discovered Christ and immediately said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into the, to your kingdom. All the saints throughout the ages are similar. They walked in the footsteps of Christ, lifting their cross, forgiving those who persecuted him persecuted them, putting up with injustice. Think of Saint Nicodemus. What did he, how many things did he go through? He kept silent. He carried his cross. He suffered. And when they opened his tomb, before they opened his tomb, his body gushed forth with myrrh. The, the Lord glorified him. But at the end of the day, Christian spirituality and the cross is about freedom. Freedom from oneself that comes via the cross. And for this reason, the Christian does not have any problems. Yes, we have challenges. We're tested. We have illnesses, family concerns, financial challenges, pandemics, arguments about vaccines and things like that, tests and all, all these different things, health risks, but not problems as such. Problem, these problems do not derail a Christian from their spiritual program and from their spiritual routine. The Christian is free. The cross is the path that leads to the resurrection, to paradise. And paradise begins from this life. So we need to see ourselves as cross bearers. We need to allow our fellow persons to recognize us as cross bearers, to see in everything that we do, the cross, 
the mindset of the cross, the way I speak, the way I move, the way I look, the way I interact, the way I deal with an illness, the way I deal with any problem in life. We need to learn to look for the cross in our lives, to embrace it, and to enjoy the cross in our lives. Now, Apostle Paul discovered the key to the joy of the resurrection. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Kyrie Pavlos Stavropoulos, that's, I can perhaps stop here or I can continue with the story or uh, I'll leave it in your hands. I don't know how we're going for time. Everybody likes stories or maybe. Um, Do you have a story ready for us here on that? Well, for me to hint something like that, I must have something up my sleeve. Uh, <laughs> well, how, 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 are we going, how are we going for time? Personally, I have no issue with time. And I, I, I'm time going to hazard it? a guess that um, many, many here who have joined will um, not um, have any complaints about that. Okay. Well, um, in the monasteries, as I mentioned before, I'm going to give a, a monastic story just in case I can encourage some young people to embrace monasticism. <laughs> Well, we said, we said before, and most of you will know this story. We said before that in the monastery of Apostle, uh, of St. Of of, uh, Saint Paul on Mount Athos, there's that sign above the doorway that says, if you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. When I first heard that, it took me a while to try and work out what that means. There's a lot of dying here, so... When do you die and when are you alive? But there's a story in, the, in chapter 4 of the book of the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John of Sinai. And there is an account of a monk named Isidore. He was from Alexandria and, and he belonged to the ruling class of Alexandria and he decided to become a monk. And St. John of Sinai met him at the monastery, and he tells us that after a little while, the abbot of the monastery discovered that this monk Isidore was a real troublemaker. Cruel, hard-hearted, sly, and he caused havoc in the monastery. And so one day, the abbot called him up and said to him, are you sure you've decided to become a monk? Yes, he says, I want to become a monk. Well, then the first thing you need to learn is obedience. Can you be obedient? And Isidore replied, can I ever? I will submit to you like iron to the blacksmith. Okay. And the wise abbot immediately caught onto these words and said to Isidore, okay, I want you to do the following. I want you to stand at the gate of the monastery and bow before each person passing in or out and say, pray for me, Father, because I am an epileptic. And Isidore obeyed. He did this for seven years at the gate of the monastery. After which the abbot asked him to stop and actually, he actually wanted him to ordain him a priest. But Isidore, when he found out that the abbot wanted to stop him from being at the gate, and um, that uh, he was also thinking of ordaining him, he begged the other fathers and said, please ask the abbot just to leave me here a little bit more. A week. All, all I'm asking for is a week. And St. John of Sinai asked Isidore during that week, how did you cope at the gate for seven years? He said, at first it was bitter. It was a, a great struggle. 
after a year and a bit, my heart felt not as much grief. But I was thinking that God's going to reward me for this on being obedient. Another year passed and I saw in my heart how unworthy I was to be with these holy fathers in the monastery. And after a little while, I started to think that I'm not worthy to participate in the sacraments. And so I would then at the gate, as the fathers walked past, I would truly ask for the prayers of all of them that passed in and out the gate. Father, pray for me. So you can see the change at the gate. He only had a week left to live. And he fell asleep in the Lord. And he said to the gatekeeper, the permanent gatekeeper who was there, he says, if I'm saved, I will come back a week later and take you as well with me. And a week later, the gatekeeper died. The cross that Isidore carried, a bitter cross, a strange cross, really, a wise abbot, helped him to die to his old self before he died, his physical death. His old self died, and when he died physically, he didn't die spiritually, but was saved. Hence the saying, if you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. 